Cell phones. So if you have a question or comment, please request a speaker slip. One of the main things that we were tasked with was to escort convoys of KBR or Kellogg Brown and Root, which is a major U.S. contractor that's, that the military is employing in Iraq to do a variety of different jobs. And we escorted their vehicles. Um, so when the truck would break down, a driver would jump out, get into another vehicle, and go, and then leave the vehicle there. And we would get called out to, to guard it. So we would be guarding these against civilians, and the crowds would always get bigger and bigger. And we were trying to keep them back, and trying to keep them back, and we couldn't communicate with them. And um, then eventually what would happen is we would get a call back on the radio saying, well, they can't get anyone to come out and recover the vehicle, so just leave it. And so we were getting these two very conflicting set of orders. One, this vehicle is a U.S. asset. It's worth protecting, even if, even if it means killing someone else to keep them away from it. And then B, um, yeah, well, you know all that stuff we just told you? Never mind. Just leave the vehicle. Continue with your mission. Destroy the vehicles, which basically, and this happened on more than one occasion, but this specific instance was light the fuel in the, on the tank, in the tankers on fire so that enough of it burns, so that it just burns away and so the Iraqis can't use it. Um, fire grenades into the engine blocks of the vehicles to destroy them, to make them unable to, to be driven anymore. And so here we were. Um, burning fuel in front of Iraqi civilians who had to wait for lines miles long just to get a little bit of fuel for their stove or for their vehicles. And it really brought home on that instance and, and, and other instances to me the complete irony and absurdity of our presence in Iraq. In January of 2007, uh, I was asked to be a member of the, of the American Enterprise Institute's Iraq Planning Group as an Iraqi Security Forces subject matter expert. AEI, as everyone knows, contrived the surge, uh, which the President adopted. I there, while I was there, I briefed about the nature of corruption, where the generals were promulgating successes and my understanding of the failures uh, that we were experiencing. That corruption is, 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 uh, is causing the insurgency, is, ca is fomenting the civil war. When you, f when, you fo when you follow the crumb trail with respect to corruption, Iraqi corruption, it leads to American corruption. Um, and Investigating American corruption leads to the negligence, mismanagement, incompetence, dereliction of duty of, of quite a few generals and colonels who have served and still serve. 30 to 50 percent of Iraqi security forces on the payrolls are ghosts. They don't exist. And they don't exist be for a number of reasons. because. The cronies at the top of the Iraqi government uh, see that as a, as a means of, uh, of, of securing considerable sums of money in the forms of salaries of hundreds of thousands of bogus soldiers. Uh, also of note within the, the, the Sigurds report from January 2008, it reiterates previous reports by Sigurd that Parsons and other American contractors, Bechtel, North Star, et cetera, which have been written about extensively in various news uh, 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 mediums, that, uh, that of $500 million given in U.S. taxpayer dollars given to Parsons for buildings, health, and education sectors, only three of, ele of 11 construction projects have been completed, um, and 141 primary health care centers to the tune of 186 million American taxpayer dollars were not, uh, were not built. And Parsons and all of these organizations have yet to be held accountable. Um, and that is 
largely due to uh, the fact that uh, the it's against the administration's interests to hold them accountable because they are members of their constituency. That the war in Iraq was clearly a war launched and fought for and continued to be fought for for oil. The intent is to get the Iraqis to pass a law that would put everything back the way it was in the 20s. To take it from a nationalized oil system to a privatized oil system where U.S. oil companies and a little bit for the French and a little bit for the British because, you know, we like them, would own and control the oil. Now, if that happens, a U.S. government report that was leaked by ABC News said that and, and just so we are using the terminology, this is one of the, the president's benchmarks for Iraq, which the Congress adopted, passage of an oil law in Iraq. The oil law, if it is to be put in place, and if U.S. companies and the companies that are angling are Exxon, Chevron, Conoco, Marathon, BP, Shell, and Total, if they stay, they will need to be, quote, underwritten by the U.S. government. I take underwritten not by the U.S. government to mean you, to be underwritten by the U.S. military, that we will have to stay to ensure their safety and the continuation of their mission, which was the whole reason why we went there in the first place. Uh, it happened on the afternoon of September 16, 2007, in Baghdad's Nisr Square. Uh, a young Iraqi medical student named Haitham al-Rubai, who's 20 years old, was driving his mother, who also was a doctor. They had just dropped off their father, uh, his father, himself a doctor. Uh, medicine was in his uh, DNA. They got into the square that day. They were going to be running some errands, dropping off college applications for uh, his sister. And when they pulled into the square, at the same time that they arrived, a convoy of vehicles approached going the wrong way on a one-way street. I'm sure this story sounds familiar to soldiers who were in Iraq. These vehicles, which were reportedly South African Mamba armored vehicles, entered Nisar Square. They drove the wrong way down a one-way road. Iraqi police scrambled to cut off traffic, as they often have to do, not for the protection of the armored vehicles, but for the protection of Iraqi civilians who may have the lethal misfortune of getting too close to these vehicles. One car was unable to stop quick enough, and one of the gunmen atop the South African Mamba armored vehicle shot a bullet right through the head of the 20-year-old medical student. They launched some kind of projectile at the vehicle and it engulfed it in flames, and the mother and her son were melded together, their flesh <clears throat> melted into one another. One of Paul Bremer's last acts, the day before he skulked out of Baghdad in June of 2004, was to issue an edict known as Order 17, which granted a sweeping immunity to all contractors from prosecution in Iraqi courts. And he did this at a time when, when the U.S. was saying they were handing over sovereignty to the Iraqi government. Because the laws on the books right now in the United States are such that if you're a soldier and you murder someone in Iraq, you could be court-martialed, clear as, as, as could be. But right now in Iraq, as Luis said, you have somewhere between 150 and 160,000 U.S. soldiers who wear the United States flag. You have 182,000 private contractors, and that doesn't even count the armed ones. They work for 630 corporations on the U.S. government payroll. They draw personnel from 100 countries around the world. In addition to that, you have 170 mercenary firms operating in Iraq. I want to repeat that. There are 170 companies that provide services like Blackwaters in Iraq right now. That's almost as many nations as there are registered at the UN. One of, it, one of the main roles that the U.S. military has played in Iraq has been to ensure that U.S. war corporations make a killing off of that war. And, and, and KBR provides poison water to the troops. They don't even take care of the people that they're using to make their killing in Iraq. And, and, and you know, Blackwater has taken in a billion dollars in security uh, contracts just in Iraq. That doesn't count their work in Afghanistan or the 50,000 U.S. personnel they train a year at their private military base 
uh, in Moyak, North Carolina. This has not just been about looting Iraq or taking Iraq's oil. It's also about looting the U.S. Treasury. And so what they've done is they have, high, have rented an army. They've built a coalition, not of the willing, but of the billing, to go in and, and occupy Iraq. This is a subversion of the not only will of the American people now, who are pretty clearly against this war, the will of the Iraqi people, over 70% of whom want an immediate end to the occupation, but it's a subversion of the sovereignty of the nations, of those 100 countries around the world who have personnel deployed working for this Renton army uh, in Iraq.